my name is Ingrid Reed, and I'm on the Princeton Adult School Board and help plan this, not this lecture series, but other lecture series, but I'm very proud uh, to be part of presenting it tonight, The Modern Marvels, Engineering the Future, and to introduce to you a person who's going to talk about water, and that's why it's raining tonight, um, <laughs> uh, to get you in the mood for this. Seriously, we are very pleased uh, to have uh, Pro Professor Ignacio Rodriguez with us tonight to talk about, as you know, the title is Water, Keystone for Sustainable Development. Uh, Professor Rodriguez holds the very prestigious James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering in Princeton School of Engineering. He came to Princeton in 1999 after serving as head of the Civil Engineering Department of Texas A&M. His early training and work, and I think probably the things that interest him most, began in his home country of Venezuela. And his graduate degrees are from the California Institute of Technology and Colorado State University. I think the best way to gain insight into his interests, and I would say probably passions, is to describe three recent awards he has received. The 2009 William Bowie Medal, the highest honor of the American Geophysical Union for outstanding contributions to fundamental geophysics and for unselfish cooperation in research. The 2009 Edward O. Wilson Biodiversity Technology Pioneer Award the first of these now annual awards designed to recognize scientists whose work has helped advance the biodiversity of life on planet Earth. And then finally, the Stockholm Water Institute Prize, the first time that it was given to a person from South America, cites his passion for teaching, his dynamic set to solve problems, and his profound desire to understand how nature works. We are very pleased to have Professor Rodriguez with us tonight. Okay. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. It is a real pleasure to be here today. And, and, uh, I tend to speak loud, so that will not be a problem, but uh, uh, you will immediately notice my English is not without accent, so <laughs> please do not uh, uh, be shy in interrupting me if, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I speak English uh, not very well and very fast, so, you know, just tell me stop it right there or whatever, okay? That's, uh, that's uh, always in the classes I have that experience. I speak it almost as fast as I speak Spanish with uh, a very different degree of mastering of the language law. Uh, my topic today is uh, Water Keystone for Sustainable Development, and uh, it's very appropriate for tonight. I thought we were going to have 10 people, honestly, with uh, an awful weather outside, you know. You are really brave people that uh, are willing to weather this rain. and. Uh, it's a topic that really interests me a lot. I will not be getting into the technicalities of the problem, but this, uh, maybe in the question and answer period, I can, uh, I can be more abundant on the specific research that is going on in some of the areas related to this topic here in Princeton, specifically with my group. But um, I want to convey the, the, <clears throat> the understanding of why water is indeed uh, what the title says there, the keystone for any sustainable development at any scale, the regional scale, the national scale, or the global scale. And also, uh, maybe a, a brief picture of the type of problems related to water that uh, are now all over the world, again, national, locally, global scale, and the terrific and, uh, and very large impact that these problems will have, are having right now in this country and in the world, and also will have even more acutely so in the years to come. And uh, to start with, maybe we can, let me stand in the other way, I, I like to walk also. It's, uh, it's just a, a brief statistics there 
of, uh, of, um, of where we are right now in water. By 2050, it's estimated that uh, half of the world population uh, will be living in, in countries which are chronically short of water, in regions of the world that are chronically short of water. 500 million people live right now in countries where water is permanently in short supply. 2,400 million people live in countries where the water system is under stress. Water shortage is a major obstacle for sustainable development and is the leading cause of poverty and disease and uh, death of children before the age of eight. The worldwide use of water at this moment, to keep a statistic in mind, is roughly 70% irrigation for the production of food, 70%, I'm sorry, 20% in industry and 10% residential. Although this varies a lot among different countries. In the States, for example, the use for industrial type of purpose is much larger than 20%. The challenges are going to be related to both to all the three of those issues, but especially in irrigation and industry. You know, we have the idea that the tendency to industrialization of different countries is a good thing, and one cannot argue with that. You know, the Industrial Revolution, the United States, uh, 100 years or more than that ago, and right now China going through this terrific <laughs> industrialization process. Now, that has a very large impact in water. And the equation water, energy, agriculture is a very close and linked one. And now you change one factor, you are going to impact the other ones. Even more so now in the face of the impacts of climate change. Something that is here is here to stay and that is going to cause certainly enormous difficulties in this aspect. The water used by sector is this one, the one I, I, I put before. As, as I say, this varies dramatically from places to places in the world. You know, if you look at the domestic one right there, you know, which, this is the one that we use in our home. But to give you an idea, just to start, of the magnitude of some, some of these problems, here in the States, I don't remember right now, but this is probably of the order of 250 uh, 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 liters per, per, per capita in domestic use per day. In Ethiopia, it's less than two liters per person. And that includes eating, drinking the water while you're eating, washing, and all personal use in a household. Two liters per day. I had in a seminar here in Princeton in the university um, a headmaster of a school in Ethiopia, which was telling the students, the freshman, it's a freshman seminar, which uh, that, you know, in that school, is a kind of, uh, um, you know, a school for, uh, you know, people that uh, maybe with a little bit higher degree of income than the general population in Addis Ababa, and, and sorry, it was not that right, it was in the coastal area, but every morning, it was a, child, a, a girl's school, I'm sorry. Every morning they will give two liters of water to every girl. And that was it. Now, that is the face of the problems, that, that is the magnitude of the problems that we face. And sometimes we don't realize it because here or in Canada, which has even a larger amount of uh, use of water in domestic use that we do, and they have the water resources that are probably larger than the one we have in this country. You know, are accustomed to a different type of, of life. You know, what they know, we open the, the faucet of our bathroom or, 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 or in the kitchen, and nobody doubts for a moment that the water will come out. In most of the world, you open that faucet and water will not come out with certainty. Sometimes it will come out, sometimes it will not come out. And in some places of the world, it will not come out at all. You have to walk for miles to fetch the water. Now, water society and development. Water is, you know, intimately intertwined with society and development. And one thing that we have to recognize is that the health of the economy of a country and the well-being of the societies are dependent very much on the functioning of the ecosystems that maintain that economy. That is easy to say and seems like a logical thing to accept by everyone, but in general we do not act like that. And uh, this has been through history, I mean the, this, the, the, the disappearance of, of civilizations like the Mayas or, 
or the, or the uh, native populations in Arizona, or in Greenland, or in uh, Easter Island, has been precisely that. A catastrophe that happens when society abuse of the natural resources that sustain the economy, and then after a certain threshold, you produce a collapse. It's not, it's what in some in, in technical terms you will call sometimes a phase shift. It's not that it will start decreasing the slowly the standard of life. No, it suddenly collapsed the thing. And this has happened in civilizations in the past, and it happens in countries in the present. And we have to realize that we are not alone in this world. And uh, this intertwined thing that is agriculture and industry throughout the different nations of the world today makes this problem even more difficult to face. Water is fundamental for human life and is really at the very foundations of this thing, of this issue in which ecosystems collapse for, you know, the depredation of the use by societies of the resources that they, that they, that they offer to us. Now, in this issue of sustainability and well use of the ecosystem, ecohydrology, this intertwining of ecology and hydrology plays a fundamental role. This health, as I said before, of an economy cannot be separated from that of its natural support, oops, okay, from its natural support system. And any strategy for eradicating property will not succeed if the environmental constraints are not taken into account and are not really the, the most fundamental issues to consider in these problems. Ecohydrology as such, if you want a definition, will be designed to study hydrology dynamics, the dynamics of water on earth that is responsible for ecological patterns and processes. It is really the frontier of environmental sciences, and it's a very exciting field of research right now because it's a field of research in which converge the geophysical sciences and the biological sciences. That is probably where a lot of the most exciting discoveries of the next 20 years are going to happen in both in the ecological and in the geophysical sciences, in this convergence between the two. So knowledge of how this convergence takes place is critical for a safe and sustainable future. Now, right now, water has always been a fundamental issue for sustainable development. If not, you just have to look at the ancient civilization you know, all the way from, uh, from, uh, from uh, you know, Tigris and Euphrates and uh, what is now in Pakistan, and, and uh, you know how water was the reason why these civilizations disappear and collapse. And many other examples are like that. But nowadays we have something on top of that, which is climate change. And the impact of climate change will come to us in terms of water mainly through precipitation and stream flow. The changes related to precipitation and changes related to stream flow, both in both cases, water. So these in changes will, will manifest themselves mainly in the increase of the variability of the resource. And this is something that people sometimes misunderstand. Eh? It's going to decrease the water. It's going to increase the water. Well, in some places it will decrease the rainfall. In some places it will increase somewhat. But in most cases, what will increase heavily is the variability of the resource, the variability of rain. And this has very profound implications for the water sources and for the use of water for, by mankind. The Earth is usually called the blue planet, but one has to realize that 97.5% of it is seawater, only 2.5% is fresh water, and that most of it is unavailable, is in glaciers, ice, or permafrost. And so the resource that we have is in, you know, it, it can, we can run out. I mean, we can use most, more, more than we have. It's not something that, it, you know, it can, it, can, it can fulfill all our needs without bounds. It's something that really has some bounds imposed into it. Now, projected demands. Right now, the worldwide average of fresh water withdrawn per person is the order of 1,700 liters per day. For domestic purposes, it's of the order of 170 liters per day. That's on the average what we consume domestically. As I say, the variabilities are terrific. 
In Ethiopia, it's less than two liters per day. And there are countries which are even in worse shape than Ethiopia. Now, these figures will get worse and worse because the water withdrawn by populations of the different sources of fresh water has been increasing with increasing population and also with the different needs of industrialization and food specifically. All these put the resources under a very large amount of stress and also the ecosystems from which to, these resources are very much dependent, river basins, the, the, the whole global atmospheric circulation. As an example, for example, in the USA, the renewable fresh water, renewable fresh water per person has decreased from 14,000 cubic meters in 1955 to, right to a, 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 in, in 1990, was already 9,900, that's quite a decrease. And in 2055, even the good conservation efforts that are being made, it is forecast to be about 7,500 cubic meters. You see, this immediately gives you an idea that the situation is going to get worse and worse in terms of the resource itself. But the resource is very much connected to politics, besides hydrologic realities and population. And there are enormous pressures to use the surface and groundwater resources of any nation. In this country, the classical example is the Colorado River Basin. You know, it's the main source of water for seven, uh, seven, uh, seven states, and a western drought since 1999 has led to a $2,500 million water project being planned right now. To give you an idea, in Lake Mead, the water was about to go below the in the intake of water by the dam. You know, this is the type of thing that, you know, will, uh, will call for harakiri of a design of a dam, you know. If you are designing a dam to take water and suddenly you find your water below the, the, the well, that's, that was never contemplated that could go below the, 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 the outlet, the intakes of water. That has pushed Las Vegas, which is a main user of this water, to spend all kind of money to put a tunnel that will go to, in, with, uh, to, pro, to have to, 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 to lead to intakes below to the present ones. Now, why can Las Vegas do that? Because per capita is probably the city that has more money in the United States. And they say that uh, water flow uphill towards money. And, uh, and uh, you know, if, if you can pay for it, well, you know, uh, it's difficult sometimes to impose conditions that will regulate the things. Those are the facts. It's the lifeline, the Colorado, of 20 million people in seven states. And, uh, you know, in the, last, uh, uh, in the last seven years, now nine years, it was two years ago, in the last nine years, only one year has been above the long-term average. Now, all kinds of disputes start because of this between different states. And in this country, they are settled in the, in the Supreme Court. And that is fine. But in the, in the international level, there is no such a thing as the Supreme Court, and they are settled with wars and with all kinds of problems. To get, it's not only in, in, in the Colorado River, you know. In this country, for example, farmers in California, an agreement was reached in uh, 2007 in which the farmers, uh, and the, between the farmers and the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, where farmers just sold the water. The need for water was so much that the Metropolitan Water District came and said, okay, I will pay you the value of your crops. Just give me the rights of your water for several years. And that was done. And of course, that has immediate impact in what? In agriculture. Those farmers are not producing and in the economy of the state. But those type of things are taking place both nationally and international. As examples only, Lake Mead is more than 80 feet below the normal level. That's quite, quite, quite a distance from the normal level. The RLC was once one of the world's largest freshwater bodies, and now it's almost dry. Why? Because the Soviet Union decided that it was very productive to irrigate lands to produce cotton, textiles, which bring a lot of money to the economy, and then diverted the main two rivers 
that will feed the, the RLC into, for, for, into them that will go for irrigation purposes and not to the RLC. You know, a few years later, the sea is beyond recovery right now. You may, or you may have seen photos of that. It's just parts of land. I mean, it's gone. I mean, you can see even, you can see even pretty large ships just sitting in the land there. The, the Dead Sea could disappear entirely by 2050 because the Jordan River is being diverted for all kinds of things and also the water tables are being overexploited. You overexploit the water table when you take more water than it receives from rainfall. So there are two types of aquifers, the one that are replenished by rainfall and the one that are fossil water in which there is no replenishment. Even in this case, uh, the replenishable aquifer there is being exploited beyond the, the, the safe yield. So it's going down. 2004, Turkey, Turkey I'm sorry, and Israel came to an agreement. Turkey will sell water in ships, in tanks to Israel and receive military aid from Israel. They will get tanks and will send water. That just finished, in fact, that, 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 that agreement was, uh, was just uh, was, uh, closed uh, this year, uh, 2009. And in the Gulf of Mexico, there is an area of the size of New Jersey which is incapable to support life because of the pollution, uh, polluted discharge from the Mississippi River. 1.7 million deaths every year result from dirty water. And these deaths are very much concentrated in the developing world, and especially among children. The equation that controls most of this problem is the equation of agriculture, energy, population, in which water is the key in all of them. Farmers in this equation are losing to cities. Why? Because industrialization produces more money than food. You know, emerging industries get priority in the use of water. That was the example I was saying before. In 2003, San Diego bought annual rice to 247 million tons, approximately 680,000 cubic meters per day of water from farmers in the nearby Imperial Valley. This is the largest rural to Europe, I'm sorry, rural to urban water transfer in the, in the history of the United States. That's water that is not being used in agriculture. And farmers are losing, are losing water, not only because they are, all, they, they, they are faced with this, with, this, uh, with this competition from industry, but also because they are faced with a shrinking supply because of climate change. Now, a scarcity used to be a local issue. So a region will have a scarcity of water, and they will have problems. But now has become not only a local issue, has become much more important than that, a national, and much more than that, a global type of issue. Why? Mostly because of that equation before of ag uh, agriculture and industry. And more than anything, agriculture and history. You, you, you could also count the, you know, the, the domestic use and all that, but that's minor in the amounts. The, do you know, the, you need food to survive. That's the key thing in this equation. And the, the best way to import food is, if you know, is, is importing food is the most efficient way to import water. If you don't have water, you cannot produce food. When we go, at this moment, it's, it's, maybe it's good to, 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 to realize this. The amounts, the quantities involved in uh, food production, sometimes people is not aware of them. When you eat a, a, a hamburger of a beef, a, a kilogram of beef, in whatever kind, typically you're using close to 15,000 liters of water. When uh, it's a kilogram of poultry, it's about 3,000, rice close to 2,000, wheat a little bit under 1,900 or so liters of water. Now, these numbers are gigantic, but that's what people eat. And it's been a transformation in the culture of different nations from uh, more uh, crop dietary type of, 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 uh, of aliments into more meat type of things, pork, poultry, or beef. 
That has a terrific impact on water, as you saw there. Now, you see, when we talk about this, we have to consider two things in here. It's, it's, it's good to differentiate between green water and blue water. The green water is what we call uh, the water that uh, you know, comes from rain, and the plants use directly from the soil. They transpire, they produce the biomass, the crops grow. That's green water. 70% of the agriculture of the world is based on green water. 30% is based in blue water. The blue water is the one that comes from the reservoirs, from the aquifers, and the one that we manage. The other one we cannot manage. It comes from above. It comes from the clouds, rains, and the plants use it. Now, this is the difference between irrigated agriculture and non-irrigated rain-fed agriculture. The United States is in a wonderful situation in that aspect. Most of, of uh, although the statistic is not very clear, probably 60 or 70 percent of the, of, the, of, the, of the agriculture of the United States is rain-fed. That's great. China, on the other hand, is the other way around. It used to be, and still is, that the largest percent of the agriculture in China is come from blue water, not from green water. It's irrigated type of agriculture. This has dramatic consequences, both in terms of the efforts of the economy and also in the impact of climate change. Most of the developed world will live or die in terms of green water. To believe that we are going to build dams all over the world to regulate, to control the storage that will provide enough quantities of blue water to feed the people, is, 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 I think is, 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 it doesn't hold much, much true to it. I mean, uh, 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 the technology, for that you need an amount of technology that, that uh, you know, it will take a long time, if ever, to reach in some part of the world. It's green water with traditional methods of agriculture, and that can go a very, very long way. True. But you see, true, but on the other hand, every country is connected to any other country. I said before that the best way, I think I had it there, Oop. Yeah. Oop. before that, the best way, the importing food was the most efficient way to import water. We talk nowadays about what is called virtual water the virtual trade of water in the world. And, uh, you know, there were three main producers of grains and, and food in general, but mainly of grains, for, for feeding the world were the United States, Russia, and China. The United States keep doing the job. China, in some cases, have gone from a great export of grain to import grain because of the big push that China has had towards industrialization with great results in some areas. No question on that. The standard of living has increased, et cetera, et cetera. But has to import right now some, uh, some grain. And it imports from the United States. This, this poses extremely interesting political situation, you know, because people say, well, who has the external bond, uh, the, the, external, the bonds of the external debt of the United States China? And uh, who is important, uh, where is China important part of the food? United States. You know, it's, it's kind of a game that goes way beyond just the issue of water. Water plays a most important role, but you can see immediately the political implication that this has. The, the, the amount of oil that food buys has fallen 13 times since 1973. I think right now it's much more than that with the spike in oil prices, probably called 20 times. What this means is food prices have not gone up dramatically. They're starting to go up very uh, uh, now, okay? But in the last 20 years or so, what has gone up very much is oil. So, you know, different nations decided that agriculture was not really the best way to put your efforts into. You know, it was much better to go full industrial type of thing. And I cannot argue with that. But as long as you keep a decent balance with agriculture, with the, with the agricultural basis of the country, this trade of water, of virtual water between different countries, 
It's an extremely complex network. And uh, if you see a map, I, 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 was, I tried to make one, but it, was, uh, it didn't come out very nice. You will see arrows going from a country to another country, you know, exporting, for example, you know, suddenly you find Belgium exporting bananas. You say, what? No, Belgium doesn't produce any bananas. And uh, you know, well, it's a way for Belgium to get more virtual water. They import the bananas from Guatemala, give Guatemala something else, and then they import enough banana to give another client, you know, to export themselves. And what they are exporting really is virtual water. The thing has come to a point in which countries are releasing large pieces of land around the world in other countries to cultivate. For example, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is leasing right now big tracts of land in Ethiopia. Now you can imagine the complication that this brings in the international scene. Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, among other countries, but those three countries are the main ones, are beneficiaries of the Nile. Most of the Nile is born, most of the water of the Nile comes from Ethiopia, really. The headwaters, the blue and the white, okay? And, uh, but, uh, you know, Egypt was the big gorilla, the big, the big country, you know, the, the how do you call it, the 64,000 gorilla, whatever it is, you know, the big, powerful country in the region. And uh, has always posed the thing in very dramatic terms. You touch that water, we go to war. This is, has been found, I mean, the argument has gotten, I don't think it has any basis, but anyway, the rationale has been that the English, in a treaty of Khartoum, they decided so much water for, for Egypt. Of course, they were in Egypt. So much little water for, for, for Ethiopia. Ethiopia were the Italians. And so much for Sudan. Until those things changes, those equations become extremely complicated. And this leasing of big tracts of land for agriculture is taking place right now because of this importance of water for food. If you don't have the water, you cannot grow the food. It's as simple as that. That's the case of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia years ago decided, well, three years ago, when the big, uh, after the 1970s uh, oil, uh, oil crisis, all, you know, OPEP embargo of oil, with the prices skyrocketed and all that, Saudi Arabia got a little bit uh, a little cautious and said, well, they may do the same thing to us in food. Let's grow to our own, let's grow our own food. And they put an enormous amount of resources to try to grow their own food, over-exploiting the, the aquifer, which is the only source of water for Saudi Arabia, which is a fossil aquifer. It does not have a natural recharge. It was so expensive and with such terrible results that had to be abandoned a few years later. Right now, Saudi Arabia lives from virtual water. When you import food, when you are importing is water. It's a trade of water that goes around the world. Now that trade takes place in two types of commodities, the green water and the blue water, and they have very different costs. How that network that connects different countries in terms of the flows of virtual water that go from one country to another, how the network organizes itself, self-organizes, in function of some constraints of economical type, especially gross domestic product, for example, is a beautiful area of research. We right now here in Princeton, some groups are really interested in and, and are trying to break into it. You see, these are very complex networks like they exist in other fields. And they tend to organize themselves with an internal dynamic. Is what they call self-organization at the time. You know, you, you look at New York, for example, and New York is a wonderful example of self-organization. How is the New York Times in every corner? And how is you can find milk in every, in every block of New York? And how that, the mayor of New York is not worried about milk in every place, and the New York Times, blah, 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 blah. I mean, the system works in some way, which itself organizes. This network 
of the trade of virtual water also self-organizes. Now, what are the rules of self-organization? We already know some of the characteristics of that self-organization that goes on. But what is the dynamics behind of it? Still, we don't know. And it's crucial that we get to know. You see, because there are no's and no's. United States as a node in that network is much more important, say, than Bolivia as a node. Although Bolivia exports virtual water, I have to say. But Brazil, United States, Argentina, Australia, China, although they are importing some, they still export other, other products, are big nodes. Now, if you, ha if, if you are worried about the network, if you are worried about the security, the safety of a network, you have to worry about some, some specific nodes. Like, for example, if you are talking about the internet, the mother of all nodes in terms of hits, which is what? Google. And you know, it's orders of magnitude above everyone. And uh, the same thing, that it, it has a specific name, it's called power laws, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it has the same kind of organization you can see in this trading of virtual water among nations of the world. How that trading will be impacted because a particular node is suffering from terrorism, drought, climate change, a particular political decision is extremely important to know. It's extremely important to be able to try to forecast, at least probabilistically, what will be the impacts of that. Because that's what controls the feeding of all the world. Now, this is, and, and now, this is what I just mentioned before, to give you an idea of the changes that are taking place because of industrialization, China, which was producing a peak uh, of 392 million uh, of, uh, of grain in 1998, it went down to 358 in 2005. Well, that drop is larger than the annual Canadian wheat production. That amount of grain didn't go into the trade of food that exists in the world, just disappeared. It has to be supplied from somewhere. And this network of flows is the one that will control that. And that will be controlled by water. In fact, in 2004, China had to import 7 million, and now it's importing more, in fact. Food versus oil. You see, it's agriculture versus industry again. In USA, it's the largest importer of oil and the largest exporter of grain. It's still the great farm of the world in this country. Saudi Arabia is a wonderful example of the largest exporter of oil and a leading importer of grain. And now, the drastic decline in the exchange rate between oil and grain is taking place in time of falling water tables, decrease of river flows, climate change, pollution of water sources. This is terrible for the water issue. And it's, it's really, you know, it really forecast a situation for the world in general in terms of food that is very, very dramatic. In terms, uh, and, and you know, we, we, we took a look at, a, a minute ago to the amount of water used just for kilograms of beef and, and, and rice and poultry, whatever. Here is the amount of water look at for a kilogram of paper. 300 liters of water for one kilogram of paper. Much more than for a kilogram of steel and even much, much more than for a liter of gasoline. Now, if, for example, the population in China decided to use paper at the rate that we use paper in this country, there will be no water in the world. And there will be no trees in the world to produce those paper. Now we say, hey, they cannot go that route. But we win that route. So we, it, you know, it has to be a harmonic change in which they change and we change. Because it's not that easy to tell a country, hey, 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 you cannot go that way. We already went there. We were first. But the fact is that, they, you know, if you multiply the population of China for those amounts, there will be no water in the world. And there will be not enough trees to produce that kind of paper. So there has to be 
you know? And these are type of factors that control this thread of virtual world of this network I was talking before. That's what it has become from a local problem that used to be to a regional and then national problems now is very much so a global problem. Now, all this, I said before, in top of all that is climate change. And the impact of temperatures and the, uh, 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 will be mainly reflected in our normal life in the impact that we will receive because of the changes in water. The changes in precipitation and the changes in stream flow. Although this is from the IPCC, although it is natural to think first of temperature when we think of global warming, the impact of climate change in precipitation may be even more important in the long run for many places and many people. And if so, what is going to change there? What is already changing? The fluctuation. What really impacts us more than anything else in the, in, in, in the issue of climate change and water is the increase in the variability, in the fluctuation that the resource will have. And what you could call the phase, in the moment the resources become available. For example, the variability, you, you may have a, a region in the world, and there are many regions in the world in which you cannot detect right now a decrease or an increase in precipitation because of climate change. But what you can detect immediately is an increase in the fluctuations of precipitation and therefore of a stream flow of the rivers because of climate change. An example of that, by the way, is the Colorado River itself. But you can observe that in many regions of the world. That immediately brings the need that in order to use the resource, you will need much more storage. Why? Because the only reason you need a storage is to control fluctuation. In this, you know, in the United States, you seldom see, I, I don't think in New Jersey, certainly not in Princeton, houses in which you need water tanks at home to store water. Almost everywhere else in the world, and almost, you know, you take 10% of the world out, in the places where you have water, you have to place tanks. I will tell you a personal experience. Years ago in Venezuela, and Venezuela has plenty of, of, of rains and, and rivers, rivers during open, many rivers, etc. Et in, the, in, uh, in, the, in my home, in the, my house, we had, I designed the tank. I say, ah, I'm not going to be stupid here, you know. And uh, against all sanitary norms, because it's no good to have large storage of water. The first tank was of the order of 12,000 liters. Very quickly, I built another one connected to that one to 50,000 liters. And I'm getting, you know, to a small dam already, you know, inside, you know, in, in, in the backyard of the house, in the front garden, you know, and people have that. I have seen plenty of apartments in which in the apartment you have a tank in the middle of a bedroom. And you say, my goodness, I hope this structural thing is good enough because, you know, there's a lot of pressure concentrated in a point. Because water arrives once in a while, and you don't know when it's going to be arriving again. And you may have a week water every day, and then 10 days, two weeks, seven days without water. This is the problem that plants face, and this is the problem that we face. And then we face it in our homes and in industry and development, and the ecosystems also face it. And in terms of climate change, that's what will increase. It will increase the variability. Now, if you are a plant, you know, look at, look at the problem that you face. And this is, it's, 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 I, I give a problem to my, I sometimes teach a, a, a course in probabilistic modeling for engineers. And I tell the student, okay, I'm going to give you a problem. And uh, I'm going to give you four years of Princeton. I'm going to give you a scholarship of $200,000. That's pretty good. Now, for four years, but I'm not going to tell you when the check is going to arrive. I'm not going to tell you how much the check is going to have. Organize your life. And you know, 
That is what the plants face. They don't know when it's going to rain. They don't know how much it's going to rain. And that's why some plants have deep roots and some plants have short roots. In the case of the students, I always find that it's very interesting to see the division between them, between what I call the, the Anglo-Saxon mentality, in which you know, people say, watch out, you know, I cannot spend so much because you know, I don't know when the damn check will arrive again, blah, 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 you know. And they are, you know, they are, and you know what I call the Latin, Latin mentality, the check arrives, you know, boom, I will spend it, I will have it, and the other one should arrive not very far from now, okay? And in fact, it's very easy to model. You model a little bit mathematics as a Poisson process, the, you know, the arrivals of the thing. And then what I have to, they have to do is build a small computer uh, program, very, 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 very simple to do. And then the, the evaluation degrade is given for your quality of life. You know, if you are always living like in pauper with a $200,000, you know, you, you don't get a very good grade in that assignment. Now, if you are willing, willing uh, living in the other hand, wonderfully well for two weeks and dying of hunger for another two weeks, you also don't get a very good grade. Well, those are the plans. Plans have that kind of decision, in, in, you see? And that's why you have grasses, which are very much like Latin style, by the way, you know? They have short roots. And they transpire as crazy when they can, when they have water. To hell, you know, with, oh, let's we go. And you have trees. Which are much more Anglo-Saxon style, you know. They, 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 you know, they have. There is a storage in there to be taking the water when they need it for the production of biomass. Well, with climate change come, with climate change is here, the effect of climate change will be precisely to change the variability. And if you have been accustomed to a certain variability, and have grown accustomed to that, and have evolved according to certain rules of the game in the variability, you're going to be faced with an increased variability. And that will make your life much more difficult. That will put ecosystems into a lot of stress. And not so much, hey, is the water going to decrease or not? Probably will, maybe not in some places, whatever. Much more important is going to be the increasing variability. And that increasing variability, nobody argues that is already taking place. Now. This as an example of that. This is Kenya, and this is the Opera Guaso Njiro Basin. And there, very, very much in there, there is an Impala research station where Princeton has a, 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 a research station, which uh, I don't know how long ago was it donated to Princeton. Really. Decades ago. And we sent on the graduates and graduate students there. And right now, there's a group there. And some of our gravitational do thesis, and some of the graduates also do thesis, and both in engineering and, uh, and uh, ecology and, uh, and sociology. They go there and work. Now, in that, this, let me go a little bit faster. This is an, a station, rainfall station, gauging station, that was uh, put there by the English. And, uh, and God bless the English, they collected very, very good records of rain since 1920 which is very, you know, it's not common everywhere, and much less in Africa, and some, 1930, really. And if you see in there, I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but if you look, oops, if you look at the, at the at, let's look at the long range here, okay, and this is the rate of arrivals of storms, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, lambda days to the minus one. And, uh, and the, the, which is the one, of course, I'm sorry. This is the one, what I want. This is the important one. This is the early season. This is the rate of arrival of a storm, meaning the number of wet days during the growing season. And you see here a decreasing type of trend. This is the units are days to the minus one. So when you say 0.2 is one storm, one wet day on the average every five days. And on the other hand, if you see the amount of rain that the different storms bring, it tends to go up. It tends no, it goes up. Now, what is happening in this particular case in Kenya is that, and in over whole, the whole country, in fact, is that the number of wet days during the growing season is decreasing. 
the number of rain events is decreasing, but the size, the total amount of rain per event is increasing. It's like the check was arriving now with, on the average, at a longer time span, but the amount of dollars it brings is more. That's bad for a plant. Anyone who has a garden knows that it's much better to irrigate, you know, to, to water the plants a little bit with certain frequency than just a lot unfrequently. That's no good. And then what is happening then is that the, the, the distribution of vegetation in the basin is starting to change. So as species are getting out, are, are being displaced by other species that are more, more, uh, more fitted to live in this type of condition. And that you can observe already in Kenya. Now, in, this, in many parts of the world, including Kenya, but also in all, in all Central Africa, what is called the Kalahari region of Africa, savannas are extremely impacted because of this. Savannas are, are extremely important all over the world, but especially in the developing world, and are this stable, or more or less stable type of living together between trees and grasses which have very different characteristics. The grasses are short, the roots are not deep, the trees are tall, the roots are deep. And nevertheless, they live together, making optimal use of the water. How do they make optimal use of the water? They make optimal use of the water because the grasses, which are very Latin in their response, tend to contract and go dormant or die into quotation marks in the word die because they also write very quickly too, okay? when you have a dry period, a dry year, allowing the trees to use the water that if there was not a drought on, it will be enough for trees and grass. So this balance in there takes place, and takes place because of the dynamic character of grasses. Now, with climate change, it starts impacting the thing. This dynamic equilibrium between the trees and the grasses is lost, and suddenly you go from an unstable ecosystem in which you have these two types of vegetation, very different, providing a livelihood to a lot of people in the region. Both trees and grasses are necessary, and in there is an equilibrium, a peculiar equilibrium, but an equilibrium of pastoral societies and farmers. And in one, if, if you know, if the grasses go out, then very quickly, the pastoral societies are in problems, and their livestock starts eating the trees. And rather than a savanna, which becomes green immediately in the rainy season, what you get immediately is a parched soil susceptible to erosion. And after you get into this kind of soil condition, in which the vegetation disappears, and you are hitting the boundaries of desertification, there is no way back. The certification, what we will call an, an attractor, which is very difficult to get out of it. Huh? You don't get out of the certification. And in these delicate systems in which one type of vegetation and another type of vegetation work together to benefit of each other, this time of increase of the fluctuations of rainfall is terrible and dramatically impacts this interplay between them leading to the certification. It's not only that the case in Africa, it's also the case in southern Spain, where a very important region of agric agricultural character uh, for the agriculture of Spain and for many cities of the world come from the Valencia, the Cante, Murcia, all this part of Spain in there. That, if, if you know, right now, some part of that region are going to the, are in danger of the certification precisely because of that. Now, how are we going to change that? Do we have, do we have time, are we on, do we have hopes to change that? Well, there are some effects that are already running and will keep running. But certainly, we can put everything, all our efforts, in try to slow down some of these impacts and we can do a lot. We can do a lot. Now, some kind of, I don't know, understanding, and some kind of, 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 of mutual 
uh, 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 of, of uh, you know, acting together between nations have to take place. Because, as I said before, you know, this, this is a global problem in which everybody is interconnected. This is not a problem in which the United States or England or Italy or Egypt or whatever can say, we are in our own, tough luck for you. No, no. In fact, if you look at a, 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 a map, I'm sorry I cannot put together a nice one, it becomes a mess of lines going in and out, uh, of the United, of the, world, of the uh, uh, world trade of virtual water. United States is the Google of that, of that network, true. But it's also the node that has more arrows coming in. Meaning, we are the country that has more arrows coming out in total volume of water, okay? We were also the country that has more lines coming in. Why? Because of the imports that this country needs and is able to pay for. And those imports go all the way, not only in food, not only gasoline, but also in cotton. And when you buy something that says, made in, 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 I don't know, the Soviet Union. That cotton probably came at the expense of the RLC. So this is a global problem that will need to be tackled with global policies. We are still on time, yeah, we have time, yes, but we, you know, we don't have a heck of a lot of time. The problem of water in the world is really crucial and is the, the controlling factor of both the equation for agriculture and food, and the equation for energy. I have some more in there, but I better stop right now and ask you, you know, for questions from the audience. We have still some time to go. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, please. That's a very good question. Is desalinization has an impact or not? At present, as we have it known. Now, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an avenue of hope. My, 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 I am always an optimist. I will say yes. But at this moment, no. I will give you an example. Uh, Spain decided to go for massive desalinization in the southern coast, in the Mediterranean coast of, of Spain, at an enormous cost that they will have to give up very soon. Because right now, desalinization is very high in energy. You know, either you do it for multiple distillation, you know, for pressure, you know, it's extremely energy. And the cost of energy right now are extremely high. So now, is it a solution at a point in a space for a particular situation? The answer is yes. Israel will have, Israel will have to use this and does use it. And it's very advanced in this organization techniques for some specific aspects. But to try to use, for example, Water from desalinization for massive irrigation is out of the question. It's, you, know, you buy the food. Not only is it much cheaper to buy the food because of the cost of energy to do desalinization, but also the environmental impact of desalinization comes from several sides. One is the energy you are buying, that where is it coming from, okay? Mainly from fossil fuels, okay? And the second one is that you have to dispose also of the brine. Okay. Now, can you use it for local purposes? Yes. Um, the U.S. has a, a couple of plants, which uh, one of them, uh, one is in Santa Barbara, state of the art, they said they have never been used. Will it be used or not? Or not? It was built, it cost a few million dollars, etc. And another one in, the, in, in, uh, in Arizona, in, uh, in, uh, to, 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 because this one, so the Colorado River has a, pro well, has a problem. It's a boundary river between Mexico and the United States. So some uh, Mexico complained that, uh, you know, that a lot of, you know, the degrees of, so the, the level of salt was much higher than the treaty will say. And it's very funny because if you compare the records of two stations in the river, American and the Mexican, you know, the Americans say wonderful quality and the Mexicans say terrible quality and you don't know really where is the truth, you know. But, but the, the fact is that that plan 
have never put, been put, put in use again. Because again, the cost, both in money and environmental impact right now. Now, if there is a breakthrough in desalinization, which will make it possible, you know, at a very decent price or at a very decent energy cost, it will be a magnificent thing. Yeah, but you know, you, 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 you need a, okay, solar power, you know, that may be, I mean, people is trying that. Still, we are not there. We are not there. Probably the, the country that is, that is doing a better use of that is probably Israel, and it's a very localized type of use. Again. Yes? Yeah, uh, the question is good again. Mm, I will say the experience says that it's not possible to say. The reason is the following. The standard of living and the consumption changes so dramatically throughout time that you will need to forecast first what is going to be. The ways that, I put the example of China, for example. You know, if the population of China decides to have the asphalt use per person in rows that this country has, they run out of space in most of China anyway, okay? Now, that means that, it, you know, it cannot go that way. Now, what way will that go? Now, what way will it go, for example, the, 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 the uh, 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 paper consumption is going down. That's true, you know? Now, certainly, that's an issue and it's a problem. I, 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 I grant it to you. Now, to be able to make a forecast of that equation is not, is not easy. Oh, uh, it, well, it, again, it, it will, uh, see, will, the problem, I don't think it can be tackled that way. If you have a certain level of training and education in most of the developing world with respect to the use of green water, you could solve nowadays most of the problem. Niger in Africa is a good example of that. You know, with a very, very down-the-earth technology. And with, it's not a particular rainy country. They have advanced a lot in their own cell, uh, food production for, for the nation itself, in parts of the Niger, not in all the Niger, okay? Now, uh, uh, I don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure you can work it out the other way around, okay? Because of this. But it's a good question. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's impossible to, yeah. Is, is the water that is, you know, the, if you put it back into the river, if you use part of it and put it back into the river, it's only, you only count the one that, the difference between what you get in and you put out, okay? It's, that, that, that is, if you know, if you don't put anything back because all, everything goes into the atmosphere, it's water being consumed. And that's blue water. And that's expensive water. Now, will that come back as green water? Yeah, well, you know, water is conserved. But where will it come? And, but that's blue water, right? But that will be water consumed, yes. As blue water. It has, you know, it has, it has play, it is, the roles of deforestation are multiple. It has an impact in climate change, okay? And we know that, okay? Because it impacts the general circulation of the atmosphere, you know? It impacts the heat balance. You take out the plants, you take out the transpiration. And transpiration is, is a, you know, a heat pump. And, and, uh, and, uh, and so it has an impact that goes, if you deforest large tracts of land, 
depending on where the land is, you can have major impacts in the global circulation and impacts in the rainfall in places of the world you wouldn't even think of. The most crucial example of that is the Amazon. The Amazon is kind of the long system of the general circulation. You know? it's, it's an immense river basin. It's, uh, the river itself is, what, more than 10 Mississippis, one on top of the other? The average flow of the Amazon is over 200,000 cubic meters per second. That's a heck of a flow. One cannot even imagine that until one sees the river. Oh, I say, my God, this is a sea moving. Besides, move as full of speed, more faster than general rivers do. I mean, they usually rivers do. But now, deforestation in the Amazon, that's why people are very worried about the Amazon, okay? Now, but deforestation has another problem. Deforestation also has a problem that when you take it out, you know, you are going to risk soil desertification. And also, why did you take it out? Because if you deforest, Many times, the deforestation takes place to put crops in there for energy purposes. This is what is going, for example, with ethanol. You know, ethanol has, has, been a, has led to a big push in some areas of the world for deforestation. You know? Let's take out the trees and let's put either corn or sugar cane, etc. You know? A different types of ethanol, if you are working with, with you know, sure, cane ethanol is much, much more efficient than, than corn ethanol. You know, it's, it's of the order of eight units of energy per unit, one unit you input into the system. In the corn ethanol, if you are lucky, you have 1.5. Now, one question you can ask yourself is, why corn ethanol has been so popular in this country? You know, and the only reason, I think, is political. Because, you know, uh, I think was... McCain, when in the previous election, said that he was not in favor of ethanol and he lost Iowa badly. And in this election, he was all for ethanol. <laughs> As Hillary and Obama and everybody else in order to win Iowa. But I think 30% of the production of, 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 of corn in Nebraska last year was dedicated to ethanol. Those are very large figures. And the reason, you know, farmers are happy. Well, that's a crude way to put it, you know, but you say, well, I have the subsidies. And I'm going to make much more money than selling the corn. Okay? Much, much more. Now, that thing not only takes food out of the equation, and this is a global village. I mean, everybody is connected. That's corn that will not be available but also leads to conditions in the soil which are quick, you know, you lead to quick erosion of the soil. And, and you, will end, you, know, you will end up losing the, 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 the whole thing. Now, again, you know, they put in the question, one of the was the word politics in there. No, politics is a very, plays an extremely important role, both at the national level and at the international level in these things. But... Uh, Deforestation may, most of the times, takes place for reasons like this. In this country, have not been for ethanol, but for example, in Brazil, has been to have more tracts of land for that. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Let me put something first. I'm not a climate researcher, okay? But I will tell you something. The enormous majority of climate researchers uh, uh, will, without inclination of politics of any type, will say, yes, there is global warming already going on. Now, time out. Nobody, 100% of the people will say global warming is in. But what we're, we're talking about is the causes of global warming. A natural cost run propogenic cost. That is a trend towards warming. That's, that's a given, okay? Now, somebody could say that's a trend towards warming that has happened in the past. Or that's a trend towards warming because it has very 
clear causes of anthropogenic origin. That's, that's the point, really. I think what your question is, 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 uh, is referred to. And I will say the immense majority of climate researchers will say, yes, there is an anthropogenic component and a strong anthropogenic component of global, of global warming. What uh, we can defect, as, uh, sorry, what we can detect as hydrologists is the impact. But I can, uh, you know, I, I don't deal myself with it, uh, with, with the problem is anthropogenic or not. But I am very, I'm here in Princeton, we have an excellent group of climate researchers in the, in the Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences program, which, uh, you know, I don't think you will find anyone in there that will deny the fact that uh, I don't, uh, but I have to grant to you that there are some people, respectable people, but it's a very small minority. Very, very small minority. At least I will act like if it exists, because if I have a disease and I go to 200 best doctors that I choose, and 198 tell me, Ignacio, you have this and this and that, you better take this. And to say, don't worry, I take the damn medicine, okay?